Hi everyone, let's continue by looking at institutional factors that can promote or hinder development. In the previous video we looked at education, healthcare and infrastructure as our three major pillars of development. Here I'm going to look at four more, either that promote development or that can hinder development. Let's start by looking at taxation. We, we called kind of the benefits of tax revenue a fiscal dividend in the previous video. And we said that you know, when the government gains higher tax revenues, it can use that money to spend on education, health, infrastructure, right? We've talked about this before. Um, however, there are major problems, there are major barriers to efficient use of government tax revenue and whether that tax revenue will actually promote development and whether revenues will be generated in the first place or not. Let's consider some of those. Well, first of all, corruption can get, into the, get in the way. Uh, corruption in terms of whether the government or politicians will actually spend this money efficiently or whether they will just keep the money as sent in their own pockets. And there are questions as to whether politicians and corporations work too closely together, whereby tax exemptions are given to firms or to people um, when they shouldn't have been given in the first place at all. Self-interested, um, greedy, poor motives, ulterior motives get in the way of collecting the correct amount of tax revenue. At the same time, we talk about corporation taxes increasing when there, is, when there is growth in an economy, but in developing countries, that's one avenue of tax revenue that might be quite limited because there is limited corporate activity that takes place. And even, even if there is corporate activity, maybe from foreign firms, from MNCs, a lot of the times tax incentives are given to such firms to promote them actually coming and producing in a developing country, which can act as a barrier. There are lots of informal markets in developing countries, which means tax collection, collection will be limited and, and not at its full potential. And because of an ever-increasing role of the World Trade Organization in the globalized world, tariffs have been falling over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Tariffs are a very easy way of collecting revenue, and for developing countries it's a major source of tax revenue. Uh, but with the WTO having a more influential role, uh, in trade in the globalised economy, the actual potential of tariff collection has been reduced, which again uh, acts as a barrier to tax revenue collection. Another way in which domestic factors can lead to development is if technology is developed appropriately and used appropriately. An example of appropriate technology for developing countries can be something like a solar cooker. So a gas and electricity might be limited, Innovative ideas like this can overcome such issues, but can also promote development outcomes. Right? So a solar cooker is a very clever way of cooking with hygiene, cooking with cleanliness, but using renewable resources instead of gas and electricity to, to cook. Uh, in India, there is lots of talk about weather-based technology coming forward. Um, where farmers can actually get hold of technology that can forecast weather conditions, that can actually measure weather conditions, and can um, formulate and give you an idea of weather patterns. But also, it can actually measure soil performance. It can measure um, plant performance, and, and when to actually take your plants out of the ground, when to actually plant new seeds based on the optimal soil conditions. So all the technology that can give you measures of those things are very useful in improving the productivity on farms and in making sure that growing conditions are as optimal as possible, which can maximise potential harvests. So weather-based technology to help agricultural farmers and producers is another very useful way of promoting development in these countries. We've talked briefly about the empowerment of women. Women can be a great source of growth and development and at the moment are heavily underutilised which is why this is actually a major millennium development goal, to ensure that women are more empowered. Why do we want women to have a greater role in the economy or a greater role in society? Well, because if they are educated, if they have a greater role, if they have more power, then they are going to promote development outcomes for the betterment of the, all of society. They're going, to, they're going to promote the health of their children. They're going to want their children to be vaccinated against key diseases. They're going to make sure that sanitation facilities in the household are as good as possible to ensure health standards are high. They're also going to pursue education, not only themselves, but if they're educated, they're going to understand the value of education for the rest of their family. So again, they're going to make sure that their children are not just educated at primary level, 
they're going to make sure that they keep going to secondary level and even further, which again will generate higher incomes for the family and it will mean that, again, for the economy, there are going to be wider benefits to that. Um, the economic impacts of, of health and education benefits are going to be huge in terms of productivity, in terms of job creation, in terms of incomes, great. And it also means that um, women might see the, the need for children to be less, the need to actually give birth to lots of children to be less, if they understand themselves that through education incomes can be higher, then potentially there is no need to give birth to so many people to work on farms. At the same time they may understand that contraception is available, in the, uh, is available all of a sudden. They may understand that um, with better health, with better education opportunities, there is no need to give birth to so many children as well. Okay? So with smaller families and higher income potential, um, that's again a major benefit of the empowerment of women. And finally, this is a barrier to development, unequal income distribution. We want income to be distributed as evenly as possible. If it's not, there could be major issues. What issues can occur? Well, if there is uneven, uneven distribution and only a small percent of the population are earning a huge amount of the income in the economy, then those at the lower end are not going to have much income to save. And with a lack of savings, all that's going to promote is more of a lack of investment. Furthermore, in developing countries, those that are rich and earn a lot of the money tend to be the politicians, the bureaucrats. And if they are the ones that set policy, they are going to be surely unwilling to set policy to suit the, the lower income people. They're just going to set policies that suit themselves. They're not going to really understand what the needs of the poor are in the economy. And similarly, the rich tend to divert money outside the economy. Maybe that's because it's foreign companies that are repatriating profits. Maybe it's foreign workers that are sending money back home. Or maybe it's just rich people, domestic uh, citizens in the economy that are looking for investments elsewhere, that are diverting money in other countries for those reasons. Okay? So more institutional factors that either promote development or hinder development, it's important that you know these very, very well. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.